welcome to our virtual press conference. My name is Anila Afzali, and I'm the executive director of the, of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. I'm also with the Faith Action Network and Washington for Black Lives Coalition. I use she, her pronouns, and we'll be co-moderating today along with activist and attorney Nikita Oliver. And we are recording this press conference. So if anybody wants the recording afterwards, you will be able to get it from us. I start by acknowledging that wherever we may be today, we are on stolen tribal land and we honor the land and the survival struggles and successes of our indigenous siblings. We are also in the middle of a global pandemic and we're seeing the predicted spikes of COVID this winter. Thousands of people are dying every day in the US. Many of us have sacrificed so much to do our part in containing the spread of the virus from individuals and families to schools, small businesses and places of worship. Yet prisons and work release facilities run by the Department of Corrections, DOC, have failed to take appropriate safety precautions and have become hotbeds of infection. A centerpiece of our conversation today is the jaw-dropping 71% infection rate at First Hills Bishop Lewis work release site. This is a facility for individuals on their way to re-entry back into the community, but instead they are now facing a potential death sentence with COVID. And the conditions that the men describe expose a larger unsettling pattern in DOC prisons from Airway Heights to Walla Walla, Shelton, Stafford, and Monroe. This is a serious concern for all of us in the community and a significant public health risk. That's why we have community members coming together to speak out about this, including directly impacted family members, community advocates, attorneys, faith leaders, elected officials, and more. In a moment, Columbia Legal Services Attorney and Deputy Director of Advocacy, Nick Allen, will give us an overview of the crisis. Before we get there, we want you to know that we will hear testimonials today from incarcerated people and their loved ones, along with some insight from elected officials. You can follow along in the chat for key articles and ways to stay informed or get engaged. And we will have about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Now, this is important. To ask a question, please send a direct chat message to Nikita Oliver, who will be emceeing the Q&A. And we ask that all speakers today stick to their allotted times, and we will chime in if needed if we're running over. So with that said, Nick, would you start us off with a sort of big picture overview of the dire situation we are facing? Yeah, thanks, Anila. Um, as Anila mentioned, we are currently seeing the most significant string of COVID outbreaks within DOC facilities since the pandemic began. Among these outbreaks is a common pattern of failure by DOC to respond to and control the virus. And the numbers are staggering. Almost 800 new infections at Airway Heights in Spokane. Over 400 new infections at the Washington Correction Center in Shelton over 240 new infections at Stafford Creek in Aberdeen. New infections also continue to crop up at prisons that experienced previous outbreaks, such as the penitentiary in Walla Walla and Coyote Ridge in Canal. These outbreaks has, have not been confined to the prisons. Similar ones have occurred at work release facilities. For example, in October, one of the largest COVID outbreaks in King County occurred at Bishop Lewis, where at least 35 of the 49 residents there were infected. When DOC fails to contain an outbreak at a location like Bishop Lewis, it not only has negative public health implications, but also damages the residents' ability to earn a living so they can successfully reintegrate back into the community. As you will hear from other speakers, there has been a widespread lack of preparedness by DOC. This has resulted in testing delays and errors related to isolation and quarantine practices, and routine failures by DOC staff to comply with necessary public health protocols, such as wearing masks at all times. 
DOC strategy for attempting to control the virus in prisons remains placing these facilities on lockdowns that result in frightening and inhumane conditions. People are confined in crowded cells for nearly 24 hours per day. They have limited access to restrooms. Food is served cold and infrequently. Communication with loved ones is severely restricted. People in work release facilities have not fared any better. In May, DOC retaliated against several residents at Reynolds work release in Seattle after a peaceful community demonstration there asking for safer conditions following a COVID outbreak. The retaliation resulted in a group of mostly black and brown men called the Reynolds Six being thrown back in prison. DOC freed these men only after intense scrutiny and community advocacy. But DOC did not learn their lesson because Bishop Lewis had many of the same problems. 71% of the residents at Bishop Lewis would not have become infected had DOC employed appropriate protocols. Instead, almost unimaginable steps were taken there that were in direct conflict with public health guidelines. Delayed testing, residents having to continue to share restrooms in other common areas, and some residents being forced to stay in their room with roommates who had tested positive. Like the Reynolds situation, several individuals, some of whom had reached out to legal advocates and community members to report about the outbreak, eventually ended up public health perspective. Vulnerable people in communities are vulnerable regardless of if they are your neighbors or in a prison 300 miles away. COVID does not discriminate. The way we will collectively end this pandemic is by ensuring that all of our communities are following recommended public health protocols and practices. And this is not optional for DOC. It is their duty. When we fail to protect people in DOC custody, we are all working against our own self-interests. Prison or work release outbreaks do not happen in a vacuum. Not only are the people in the prisons living in constant fear of infection and serious risk of harm or even death, but the outbreaks also affect the health and safety of the general community. Back in March and April, when COVID first entered DOC facilities, people in the prisons, their loved ones and advocates tried to tell anyone who would listen that if DOC did not take appropriate measures early on to protect people in prison and work release, the numbers we were seeing back then would pale in comparison to what we would see in the fall and winter. Unfortunately, these predictions have come true. The need to act now is even more urgent. DOC is in a crisis and immediate action must be taken to ensure that they are held accountable and that the people in its custody are provided the same protections as everyone else in our community to remain safe. Thank you, Nick, for that overview of the risks for people in DOC facilities and how it affects us all. Uh, we also apologize for those who have intruded and sort of shared inappropriate material on the screen. Uh, we are trying to get that taken care of and, and have removed folks as well. Uh, we are now going to hear from some directly impacted people and their families. Uh, Nikita, would you get us started with one of the stories from the front lines? And after that, we will hear from Seattle City Council Member Tammy Morales. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here for this really important discussion and moment to uplift and amplify our loved ones. My name is Nikita Oliver and I use they, them pronouns. We want to start first close to home with our report from the front lines on the six recent COVID outbreaks in the Department of Corrections facilities. We're beginning with men who dealt with the outbreak at Bishop Lewis work release. Work release is as close to home as you can get after prison, as our King County Council member Zahawai reminded us when we did advocacy this summer for safer conditions at the Reynolds work release. If work release is the first step to welcoming home our incarcerated loved ones, then we truly need the Department of Corrections to commit to ensuring safe re-entry with us more than ever during this pandemic. So we're going to hear the story of Colton. <clears throat> uh, Colton's story is, in many ways, the opportunity that work release gave me changed my life in a positive way. I obtained a job within two weeks of getting there, working at a nonprofit that feeds people who are without homes. I take a lot of pride in where I work and my place there. 
I followed every rule that was asked of me at Bishop Lewis, including not seeing my family, despite how difficult that was. On Thursday, after I came back to Bishop Lewis from work, I was told that the building was on an isolation lockdown because some residents had tested positive. They told me that I needed to call my employer and let them know I wouldn't be able to go to work until further notice. No one knew how long though or had protocol or a process set in place. It was the same way at Monroe too. It was like each level of staff was frantically scrambling to cover their ass with no real rhyme or reason to anything they were doing. A couple of residents who had been exposed took tests and were waiting for results, but the Department of Correction staff allowed them to continue to roam throughout the building. No extra precautions were taken. COVID is really quite simple. If someone has been exposed or potentially has a virus, they need to quarantine until their test results come back. That's common sense. Otherwise, they are likely to spread it everywhere in the meantime. Why this was not a basic concept to the Department of Corrections baffles me. And again, to remind you, these are Colton's words that I'm reading with you. The next part of the story that Colton will share with us is talking about the work that Colton was doing at Operation Sack Lunch, where he was exposed to COVID and where their job was put at risk. Colton says, I was sent to the King County Isolation Center on Aurora Avenue after the outbreak at Bishop Lewis. My overall experience there was positive. The medical staff were great, helpful, and informative. They told me my discharge date would be October 30th, following the 10 days required to isolate as recommended by the CDC and, who, and, the, Wash, and the World Health Organization. The Department of Corrections called the isolation center and extended my discharge date for unknown reasons multiple times. The Department of Corrections was yet again scrambling frantically trying to figure out what to do with all of us that they had moved off site. Even more frustrating was how the Department of Corrections handled things after I was sent home on November 3rd with an ankle bracelet. My release date was November 23rd. I was sent home with no with two changes of clothes, minimal hygiene and nothing else. None of my property, none of my money for my earned wages at my job, nothing. And then the Department of Corrections refused to allow me to return to work. Ironically, they wanted me to immediately get tested and be negative. I returned to my household with no means to provide or contribute. I don't want to be a financial burden on my family. My wife had to go out and spend money on buying me more clothes because the Department of Corrections refused to allow me to pick up my personal belongings. The DOC has shown no consideration for my reentry, my health, my contribution as an individual to society or respect for my family. I am a man, I am a son, I am a father, I am a husband. I am not just a number, I matter. Those were the words of Colton. Thank you so much, Nikita, for sharing Colton's experience and his powerful words with us. It is simply heartbreaking to hear about these kinds of experiences that our siblings are, are facing. Uh, so I want to turn now to Seattle City Council member Tammy Morales, who is here with us today. Uh, thank you for being with us, uh, Council Member. Having heard the words and experience of, from Colton and also from Nick earlier, uh, what would you say we should be doing to protect the health and well being of all Seattleites, including those in prison and work release facilities? Councilmember Morales, do, do we maybe have you on mute? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, I was blocked for a minute there. Um, thank you, Anila and Nikita um, and Nick. Thank you for sharing those stories. Um, I think it's critically important that we continue to remind our neighbors um, about the basics of uh, of keeping ourselves and our community safe. You know, preventing community spread means that we. Uh, continue to maintain physical distance from one another, wash our hands, wear masks, um, not gather, I'm begging people not to gather with those who are outside of your household during, uh, during this upcoming holiday season. Um, 
And we know that um, these are protocols that have been established most of this year. Um, why these kinds of protocols haven't been followed throughout our um, Department of Corrections system um, is, is really, um, it's not acceptable. Um, and so I, I appreciate the opportunity to use this platform to, um, to elevate the urgency of what is clearly a disregard for human life that we are witnessing from the Department of Corrections. Um, and, and we've seen it over and over again as folks are talking about um, not, just, uh, not just at Bishop Lewis, but in places across the state. I'm also painfully aware as a, as a city council member that the power to do something about this over DOC rests with the governor. Um, and so I think uh, we, we are all calling um, on the governor for immediate and swift course correction from the Department of Corrections on these matters. Um, you know, since March, we've been talking about all the ways that we anticipated this kind of problem happening in institutions where people are, are um, sheltering or are living in congregate situations. And so um, we know that the way to manage this problem is to, um, to ensure that people are kept safe. And the fact that there are protocols that are being disregarded, dismissed, ignored, uh, means that this community of people um, is really being harmed. And so we're asking for the same level of care um, that, that all of our other institutions are asking to follow, that the Department of Corrections and the state also uh, acknowledge the responsibility to keep our black neighbors safe, to keep our, um, our folks who are living in these institutions safe and to keep also healthy and safe all the people who work with them and around them and their family members. Um, you know, we're Thank trying you really- Thank you so much, Council Member Morales. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, That's just okay. We're working on time limits. Thank you so much for being here with us today and for reiterating the importance of how uh, how we keep our loved ones incarcerated safe actually keeps us all safe. Uh, please welcome our next speaker, Milo, uh, a community member who was at the Bishop Lewis work release facility and contracted COVID there. He was thrown back in prison without justification. Given legal consideration, my understanding is that Milo's attorney, John Marlowe, may take questions where needed. Milo, thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing your story. Can you share with us what happened to you? At first, I received a negative result on the corona test conducted by the corona test virus test conducted by the Department of Health. My roommate was positive. He was called down to the cafeteria along with all the other positives to have ankle monitors placed on them while I was asked to secure in my room. A little while later, I along with all the negatives from my floor were asked to go down to the cafeteria while the folks with positive confirmed cases were told to come back upstairs and pack up their property and await transfer. After a couple of hours, I returned to my room to find my roommate still in the room. Milo, just to let you know you've been muted. Okay, where would you like um, me to? If you wanna pick up uh, where you were speaking about um, the staff at the station. Okay, yeah. I immediately went down to the staff station and asked Bishop Lewis staff, why is my roommate still in the room? He is positive and I am negative. I shouldn't have to stay in the room with him, risking my health and safety. The staff person I spoke with said that he would ask a person in charge what they were going to do about the situation and if there was a possibility to either move my roommate into another room with someone else who was positive or into one of the empty rooms. Staff returned to notify me that the supervisor had denied my request to be separated from my positive roommate and that I would have to spend the evening in the same room with him as him. The concern over being exposed to the virus created much stress and anxiety. I really wanted them to not put the safety of the residents at risk by exposing us to others who have been confirmed positive. I also wonder why the staff did not ensure the safety of the residents and themselves before anything else. I wanted to know why a clear and concise protocol was not in place to prevent such affirmation incidents or stopping the disregard of the safety for the residents. Milo, thank you so much for sharing that. Do you mind also sharing with us about what happened to you once you were back, uh, once you had to go back to prison? After I spent that very stressful evening in the room with my positive roommate, 
I was tested along with the remaining residents the following week. My test results came back positive. I had COVID. What I remember feeling the most was fear and powerlessness. DOC transferred everyone who was positive to a Department of Health facility at first. After that, my real nightmare began. Allegedly, some folks were not following protocol when we got to the site. The DOC didn't bother to identify who was responsible and address the issue with them. Instead, Bishop Lewis staff just rounded up anyone located in the area that unfortunately included me. DOC officers stripped, searched, and shackled us. I was headed back to prison. The next days were dark and lonely in the hole. They put, a, put you in solitary confinement at first. The cell was filthy with no working overhead light. DLC staff provided almost no information and I was only allowed to shower once a week. I went to the shower in shackles with two officers escorting me from the cage like an animal. My isolation was filled with feelings of hopelessness and dehumanization. The feelings of uncertainty only increased how destitute I felt and the sense of hopelessness I had. Thank you, Milo, uh, for sharing that with us. Uh, what a traumatizing experience to have. I know that your attorney, John Marlo, is here with us today. John, would you like to share uh, a few things? Um, thank you and uh, welcome everyone. My name is John Marlo. Um, I have been a public defense attorney in the cell area for about um, five and a half years now. Uh, Milo was by all accounts a model participant for work release without a single write-up or less than going a review or account of his work with counselors and his lawyer, there's absolutely no reason that this should have happened to him. Milo's story is tragic, but it is not unlike that of many clients I have represented and have had to face the reality of incarceration during this pandemic. Milo is not the first client I've had who has been rid away from everything he has accomplished in work release, what he has done for himself, his loved ones, and his community for doing absolutely nothing wrong. Nothing more than breathing the air inside of a DOC-run facility. <clears throat> for me, what really makes Milo's story unique is the fact that he was brave enough to reach out to make sure that the mistreatment and negligence did not continue, keeping us all safer. And now he has had to face retaliation for simply speaking out against injustice. And that for retaliation, simply shine a light on DOC's errors, cruelty, mismanagement, to have all of that sense of pride that one would develop after making so much progress and so much growth ripped away from you and treated as less than a human being, that is a sense of fear and retaliation that I hear from many, many clients. Work release is meant to be a bridge between the cages that we throw people into and their return to our communities. However, DOC's regard for the humanity of the individuals and the broader safety of our communities has turned those bridges into pathways for transmission of a deadly virus. Over the last very difficult nine months, I have listened to the fears of numerous clients languishing in our low jails, and DOC facilities across states. Fears that more than ever, they feel like their lives don't matter to these authors whose responsibility it is to monitor them. On an almost daily basis, I see officers in these positions throwing on masks as soon as they see and recognize that someone has walked in the door. And being nine months into this pandemic here in this area, it is very confusing to wonder why they don't understand or frankly care that our clients were breathing and our family members, loved ones, were breathing that same air a moment ago. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for uh, sharing your perspective as an attorney. 
And I want to pause and take a breath and send love to Milo and Colton and to their families. I also want to just take a moment and pause for us as a community. I know that the earlier moments of this press conference were um, a bit distracting. And I know there are families on the call today that want to be able to express their care and support through the chat. For now, we're going to keep the chat uh, locked down so that we can make sure that the content of our presser is what's heard. Um, and want to let folks know if you have questions, you can direct message me. Um, and these are specifically questions that we'll ask at the end of this press conference. However, if you are a family member and you wanna be able to share a need or support or other things, feel free to direct message one of the hosts on the call and we will find ways to incorporate your statements into the press conference via the chat. We also wanna make sure that we protect the fidelity fidelity of this press conference and ensure that there are no further uh, disruptions that take away from the really important content that's being shared here today. Um, because these are not easy stories to hear and they are especially hardest to live through. So our next frontline story is from a mother. She needs to stay anonymous because she is concerned about her son facing retaliation from the Department of Corrections. And what we learned um, during our, our time of supporting the Reynolds Six is that the Department of Corrections is retaliating against family members and incarcerated loved ones who are speaking out about the COVID crisis. And so uh, we thank you for respecting her confidentiality um, as she shares her story with us here today. Nikita, when I first heard the news that my son had been approved for a room at Bishop Lewis work release, I was really happy. He would not only be closer to home, but coming home for good. He found a job within the first couple of weeks. He worked hard and was promoted fairly quickly. But then COVID hit the facility. All the men were put on quarantine and the way DOC responded made it frozen all over again. I contacted Bishop Lewis staff many times asking what was going on, what were the plans? But all I was kept hearing was, this is unprecedented. They were still trying to figure out next steps. I was so livid. This outbreak should never have happened. What were they gonna do with my son? And all the DOC was not letting our loved ones know what the was, nor were they informing the families of the fact that there was now COVID at Bishop Lewis. We were all very desperate for answers. My emotions went from anger to fear when my son called to tell me he's positive for COVID. Then a little bit of a sense of relief when I learned that he and other infected men had been sent to public health facilities in King County. It soon became apparent that my son as well as the other men were being cared for very well by the medical and mental health care staff. They were fed nutritious meals. Staff members were checking in with them several times a day and they even provided the cell phone so that they could stay in touch with families. Then suddenly I lost contact with my son. He and several others were told to pack a bag as DOC um, planned to transfer them from the King County site to somewhere else. They were not told where or why. There were rumors that some of the men were being returned to prison at Monroe Corrections. Eventually they ended up in an abandoned state uh, Department of Health building in Tumwater. The facility was filthy. They were still sick, yet now housed together in cold barrack style rooms with old dirty mattresses. The food was cold and awful. The phones had been taken away when they were transferred. And now it was so hard to contact him home because he had to borrow a phone to call us. Every went by, I anxiety and depression creeping into my son's voice. I felt so helpless. My heart was breaking as I tried my best to keep my son from spiraling. His PTSD and anxiety were ramping up each day. Finally, he shared that he was going to sleep as much as he could. He said, mom, I'm doing Being in that isolated place was shutting him down right when he'd been excited about his re-entry and future. I went from being excited that my son was home to worrying that he was in a hell hole with his life in danger and no one answering questions about what he would be or where he would be going to. Thank you for, for sharing with us today, mother. And one of the things that has become uh, very clear and very visible, but has always been true is many mothers are advocating for their children who are inside of the Department of Corrections facilities. Many mothers have stepped forward as COVID rages in DOC facilities. Can you share with us uh, what was on your mind the most when you were worried about your son? 
I would say by the very most would be just the total sense of helplessness. You know, I, I called, I tried to contact people. I w was not getting responses back and just not knowing what to expect. It's pretty powerless. Yeah, and, and powerlessness is something that we've heard from so many family members that are um, that are organizing and trying to advocate for their loved ones during this crisis. Uh, Anila, I know that you have a few things that you'd like to share, and I, I want to invite you to, to share those things with us. Thank you. I just wanted to point out uh, that we do have some other directly impacted folks, including uh, somebody who was at Bishop Lewis as well. Uh, Jade Bevan is on the call with us. We have other directly impacted family members and loved ones of those who are incarcerated on this call with us as well. Uh, we are trying to share some of stories in the chat. And I'll go ahead and share from uh, Danielle Anderson, who said that my boyfriend's mother and child are in this meeting today. Our loved one is a low level offender. We need him to be home. He's at Airway Heights Correction Center. And then we also got a message from another anonymous mother who said, I am the mom of a son who was infected by COVID-19 at the Bishop Lewis facility in Seattle. So we have the, and I'm sorry, one more comment from an anonymous spouse, uh, Airway Heights has stopped everything and it's not fair. My husband was supposed to have his review on December 12th to determine his next steps. And it was canceled because his counselor doesn't come into the building due to COVID. No rescheduled date yet. This is affecting so many inmates and their loved ones. And one more anonymous uh, family member who said, my family member was transferred to Shelton, where they quarantined three men together in a cell where social distancing was not possible. One of the three had to sleep on the floor. And we invite additional family members or directly impacted folks to also share with the co-hosts or the hosts uh, their stories if you want those highlighted as well. But we really want to emphasize that this is a serious problem that's affecting so many. And we want to make sure we actually get some action coming out of this press conference as well. And I know we will talk about some specific actions and demands. But Nikita, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to share one more uh, family member story that was sent to me. My husband is COVID-19 positive in Airway Heights Correction Center. He was locked in a cell 24 seven with his negative cellmate for 10 days. They were not allowed to shower for eight days. They retested his cellmate, but before getting the results back and after admitting he was showing 100% COVID symptoms, they still moved him to a negative area. My husband was on a medical HSR for being medically and aged high risk, yet still became extremely sick. So these are very real stories. Um, they are very real lived experiences. And so we're going to invite two of our organizers to share with you the first being Cassandra, who is both a community organizer, but is also um, um, a family member of someone who is currently locked in a DOC facility and JM Wong, who is a community organizer as well with Free Them All. And they all both uh, share stories with us as well as the demands from loved ones that are currently inside DOC facilities. Cassandra and JM. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cassandra Butler. I use she, her pronouns. I am a community organizer fighting for all of those inside and personally have two people inside of these facilities that I love very much. Today, I want to spend just a few minutes highlighting for you the incredible lack of humanity and dignity being suffered by the people that we love inside. This broken system of mass incarceration is not new to any of us, a system designed to dehumanize anyone sent inside for what the government would frame as rehabilitation, but is actually a punitive and torturous system that is proven to fail people and communities time and time again. What I would like to highlight for you today is another system failure. In this unprecedented time, a global pandemic in which the world seems to be floundering, the Washington State Department of Corrections had an opportunity early on to proactively prevent the wildfire spread of COVID-19 within this system. There were, there were legal organizations, community organizations, and countless family members calling for the release of and reduction to the prison population the providing of proper PPE 
and the opportunity to obtain quality medical care before this pandemic could ravage the population and begin to kill people. The Washington State Department of Corrections instead chose to ignore all warnings. As a result, our loved ones are suffering. They're being placed in solitary confinement. It's being framed as medical isolation. And while in isolation being cut off from all communication with families, denied showers, denied laundry cleaning and served frozen and unhealthy meals, all while having their property taken from their cells without reason. Family communications, electronic phone and mail have been reduced and in some cases intentionally stopped because of efforts for our loved ones to notify us of these extreme conditions. Reports of three to four to a cell, both positive and negative mixed with people sleeping on the floor. Hundreds of men's locked in a gym, sleeping on the floor or on cots, and in some cases only having one to two bathrooms, which means people are using the bathroom in bottles and cans. This is also the case with our loved ones being locked in cells for hours with no bathroom access. Thank you. Christina. In one case, a family member reported a denial of a CPAP machine, a required piece of medical equipment needed for this person to simply be able to breathe. In the middle of a pandemic, this institution seems to be more concerned with the continued oppression and abuse of enslaved people than they do about following the proclaimed and posted mission, vision, and commitment of their own institution. I hope that what you all have heard from me today and will hear today appalls and disgusts you in a way that will finally bring action, open your eyes, and wake you up. Our loved ones are people. They are fathers, they are mothers, they are sisters, they are brothers, sons, daughters, husbands and wives of the many people in the communities that you all live in and that our legislators count on to elect them and keep them in office. They are people that matter and the pandemic will not keep us from standing by them and will not keep us from fighting the Department of Corrections to prevent the abuse and continued killing of our people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cassandra. And I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the pain of our families that are suffering during this crisis. And I uh, want you to know that there are family support groups available. Um, please, to our, folk, to our folks that have been um, organizing those with COVID-19 Mutual Aid and Free Them All Collective. Please post details in the chat so that families know where they can find support and care. And again, just want to acknowledge um, the pain and the very real struggle. I also wanna share a story uh, from, a, from another family member. Terry Kill, my husband, who was one of the five petitioners in a lawsuit with Columbia Legal Services is in Monroe. MSU. This was also the location of the first outbreak of COVID-19. As soon as this press conference started, I got word that there is a new outbreak in the Monroe camp and folks are on quarantine. Here we go again. This is their third outbreak. Clearly outbreaks cannot be prevented after some months COVID free. It just comes back. And I think this once again just reiterates how important it is that the Department of Corrections begin to listen to families, begin to listen to our communities, and acknowledge the public health crisis that this truly is. J.M. Wong, who is an organizer with Free Them All Collective and the COVID-19 Mutual Aid Network, will now share with us the demands, um, and most importantly, those demands from those loved ones that are incarcerated in the Department of Corrections. Thank you, Nikita. My name is JM and I'm part of the Freedom All Collective and COVID-19 Mutual Aid Network. Um, I first start with two letters from people inside. This is a snapshot of the anxiety, anguish, and stress that they experience. Can you imagine how loved ones feel when they receive these messages? Nine months ago, in anticipation of these outbreaks, we offered DOC and Governor Inslee a prevention plan summarized here. Combining DOC, CDC guidelines, prison health expert recommendations and the leadership of, of our loved ones inside who have intimate experience with the prison health system. These are the demands um, that are gonna be shared. It utilized tools and policies already available to the state. It had brought support statewide from the Black Prisoners Caucus chapters, the Asian and Pacific Islander cultural awareness groups, Nuestro Nurse, Grupo Cultural and others. But DOC, the governor and the courts rejected that plan. 
choosing instead a prison health system that cannot provide adequate care even in their best year. These were choices that have tragically and predictably killed people and will continue to do so if they ignore us. They are choices rooted in racism, fear, and the systemic belief that indigenous, black and brown lives, the lives targeted by mass incarceration in Washington do not matter. A week ago at Stafford Creek, a 60 year old black elder who was positive for COVID on diuretics urgently needed to use the restroom. He was harassed on his way, maced and beaten so severely that others inside thought he was dead. A couple days later, a 30 year old black man was assaulted by guards in the day room while on a video visit with his family. After harassing the men to finish his video visitation, roughly 20 CEOs, correctional officers allegedly attacked and maced him in front of his family and peers. His peers subsequently entered the day room and stood their ground. They showed restraint. Their presence prevented the further assault of a black man. Statewide DOC has made sick people work in kitchens give, instead of giving them care and preventing infection. People are afraid to eat for fear of catching COVID. They are making people defecate in trash bags instead of using bathrooms. Our loved ones are afraid to drink water because using the bathroom involves the risk of harassment from CEOs. CEOs deploy the use of pepper spray in close and confined areas, even when it is inhumane and also known to accelerate COVID transmissions. They retaliate against people who speak out about COVID concerns. They cut off family communications when people test positive. They are restricting showers for sick people to one per week, and they have assaulted people for accessing their basic human rights, human needs. And now here we are, four deaths and thousands of COVID cases later, to hold the state accountable for the care they could be showing but are not. A government agency, Department of Corrections, is a super spreader and more intervention is needed. Mass releases, whether through governor's proclamations, expedited clemency, or through legislative bills, particularly of medically vulnerable people and elders, is the only way to relieve the pressures that COVID places on DOC. The demands today from Bishop Lewis, Stafford Creek, and other prisons ask you to value the lives and humanities of incarcerated people as foundational to public health. Our loved ones are not merely numbers. Neither are they animals. We implore elected officials and the governor to investigate the conditions that our incarcerated communities face. In ending, let's honor the lives and deaths of the, of the individuals who have died of COVID in DOC custody. Thank you. Thank you, JM and Cassandra. And thank you to all who have been doing uh, organizing and advocating with our loved ones that have been stolen by the Department of Corrections system. Uh, we know that this is a state ran system and uh, our state senators, our state legislators have a lot of power and say in how this particular system runs. So thank you to Senator Saldana and Nguyen uh, for being here with us today. And we wanted to ask you what's happening at the state legislative level and what can our state leaders be doing to ensure that we actually take a public health approach to the crisis that is happening in our communities? Thank you, Nikita. I guess I'll go first. Uh, Rebecca Saldana, state senator of the 37th legislative district. And um, and it's because of the activism of families and those incarcerated um, that we have ha that this is happening in terms of the awareness of what's happening, the um, the news coverage, and um, holding Department of Commerce uh, Corrections accountable. Um, because of you, um, we have been able to join our use our voices and our positions to be able to call Department of Commerce, uh, I'm, I might apologize, I just got off another call, Department of Corrections um, um, accountable to what happened to the Reynolds Six, what's happening now um, in many work releases and, and throughout the system in our state. And um, the Ombudsman just came out with a report um, verifying what our families and those um, that are in work release have been telling us. Um, we have got to believe um, what, um, what those that are incarcerated are telling us, what their families are telling us. Um, and to your point, um, it, it, this is a public health issue. We, um, as um, representatives of the state government, um, are accountable and are the ones that need to make sure that um, this 
system um, is being approached through public health. So one is calling on work sessions and, you know, we are preparing right now, working with you to decide, you know, to figure out if there's legislation that we can introduce. Um, is it, um, and, and also, um, yeah, so I'll just say that, that, you know, session will start in January um, definitely taking the lead from community in terms of what legislation and what is already on the books, but just needs to change because it's actually um, just their regulation and they're in, in, in moving it more quickly. Um, I do um, see that um, there is a willingness um, by um, leadership of the Department of Corrections to change. They're just not changing quickly enough or at the system level and at the, res at the response necessary that this pandemic um, and what we know about um, the racism embedded in um, incarceration, it's not happening fast enough. And so, um, but, but I know that um, know that there will be legislation, um, know that there will be continued um, pushing on Department of Corrections to move more quickly um, and to be responsive um, to what community and those incarcerated have so clearly laid out in their demands. Hey, I'll, thank I'll you, Senator Saldana. Uh, Senator Nguyen. Yeah, thank you. First off, thank you, Anila and Nikita, for organizing, and Colton and Milo and others for sharing your stories. First off, your conviction uh, to stand up for those you care about is is a true inspiration. And I, you know, we've seen again and again here and around the country that the necessary steps to protect incarcerated people from the spread of COVID is just not good enough. And we know that. If we can't get this pandemic under control, uh, we won't be able to get it under control uh, within our prison facilities, within our jails. We won't get able to be able to get it under control in our communities as well. And uh, I think you mentioned earlier uh, in the early days of the pandemic when the governor announced a reduction to the prison population. You know, I was happy to see the swift response to slow down the rate of the infections amongst the incarcerated populations. A success that was made possible by advocates in the community, many of whom on this call. Um, that unfortunately was not enough, I think, as, as a lot of us already knew, uh, and that did, it did not do enough to, to slow the transmission of COVID within our facilities as well. So first off, your, your stories are much appreciated. It clearly shows uh, that much, much more needs to be done to protect those in our prison populations. And I think a lot of what that means is simply letting people go faster, right? The means to provide a pathway other than incarceration for folks, especially those in community facilities. So. Uh, I, I share and support the concerns of the advocates here. Uh, we'll do as much as we can to push the uh, message uh, higher up with the uh, governor's office and with our legislative folks as well. We've been meeting um, regularly with the DOC to figure out how we can get more uh, PPE and equipment for our incarcerated populations uh, as well. But I think your stories are gonna be the most important. Right now, I'll be honest, there's me, Senator Saldana and a few folks who care about this population, who are working towards finding a resolution. Not everybody is on the same page. So the more we can tell our story, the more you can push the narrative, the more that we can help uplift your voices, the better it's gonna be as well, because this is gonna take more than just a couple of us on this call right now. It's gonna take all of us uh, to be pushing before the legislative session, during the legislative session and afterwards as well. Uh, there are long-term issues that the DOC needs to rectify uh, before COVID. I think it was exacerbated during COVID and we're seeing it now. Um, and we'll need your help uh, to make sure that we get these changes. So um, thank you to so much. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who's been able to share. I'm, I'm deeply moved uh, by it. And I, and I just appreciate the opportunity to be in this conversation. This is not the beginning of it. This is not the end. Um, and this is just a part of that as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, senators. And I actually have two questions that I think are most appropriate for the two of you right now. Um, and so I just want to let folks that this is us officially transitioning into the Q&A portion of the press conference. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to direct message them to me. Um, senators, the first is as it relates to the vaccine, the questions are, can vaccines be prioritized for incarcerated peoples that choose to receive them? Um, and do you all know where the prisons rate on the priority list for receiving the vaccination? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure if Senator Zadania may have more information. I know that if you look at where it's the prioritization right now for health officials and high risk um, communities, I think there's already a few hundred thousand folks already on that list. We may not necessarily have enough. Um, I did hear that comment before and am following up today as well. So the answer is not 100% sure. I know that we have a finite capacity of vaccines, um, but it is something that we're looking into. 
Yeah, I'll just add on that piece. I mean, I think it's a great question. I think this is exactly the way that you can use us as our co-chairs and members of Color Caucus um, to make that um, request and amplify the request that community is asking for. I know nationally, you know, what we're hearing, right, is um, folks over a certain age, um, healthcare responders, but then it is folks in congregate settings such as nursing homes and um, prison um, you know, populations and those that are working with them. So it definitely is aligned in terms of what I've seen in terms of the national data about where prioritization should happen. Um, but I, and I think it's something that we can def I can definitely take responsibility to make sure that um, we work with community to make it clear um, what, what we wanna see um, from our state's plan of how they're gonna um, push out um, the vaccine as it becomes available. Great, and the second question is uh, regarding um, any fines for the Department of Questions, Corrections. The question says the governor is not holding DOC to the same standards that restaurants and community businesses are expected to follow when it comes to COVID public health guidelines. Uh, why are incarcerated and work release individuals and their families not eligible for the same constituent case management and issue support as everyone else is regularly? Uh, and why do the same fines affecting businesses and commercial entities not apply to the lack of follow through by DOC and the governor's office to properly ensure public health guidelines or else be penalized in some other way? So I think the heart of this question is just wondering, is there a possibility of some sort of penalization at the state level for DOC really failing to respond to this crisis um, that we knew about in February? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Um, I think whatever it takes to hold uh, the Department of Corrections accountable, uh, you know, obviously it's under the purview of the legislature and the governor. So um, the reason why there's fines for private businesses is because it's a private business that we don't control. But since we do control the DOC, I think we should be able to hold them accountable in our own respects as well. But I completely agree. If there's protocols that are being broken, that needs to be um, brought forth. The ombuds has reviewed some of those and there's a protocol for how that is addressed. And I think that's the first report that we got back today. So first and foremost for me is making sure that the population has all the resources they need to be safe, which we know is not enough. And the second one is the ombuds is the person that would be in charge of reviewing kind of the protocols that are in place and figuring out the solutions associated with it. Thank you. And a couple of things that might tie into that is there was a question pertaining to looking at foods and goods production in the corrections industry as a potential factor of COVID spread um, and uh, asking senators to consider that as an area of focus, as well as addressing legislative concerns. There are three bills that you may know about. Um, that you could be supporting. The first is of the emerging adults bill, the juvenile points and earned uh, release time. Are the senators aware and supportive of the movement of these bills? Yeah, I think I'm a co-sponsor in all of them. And I may be running, we're still figuring out how the, the pathway looks, but for sure co-sponsor in all of them. Have they already been pre-filed? They have not. Oh, I'm, a, I'm aware of them being uh, out there as ideas, but I, um, I have, I have not. Feel, uh, I would love to know if there is a prime sponsor already on them, so that we can make sure that we're coordinating with them. Senator Wynn. <laughs> my next, my next meeting is in relation to some of those those topics. Thank you so much. Um, and just to flag two things, and if y'all want to respond to these, you're welcome to. And then I'm going to move to some other questions for other folks. Um, the first is, are there concerns of giving uh, prisoners a new, uh, maybe not well tested, I, I'm not a scientist, so I don't want to comment on the, the vaccine, but just concerns about giving the vaccine to incarcerated peoples. The second question is uh, pertaining to, regardless of prison personnel ignoring protocols, there's never any reason for officers to be assaulting those who are carcer incarcerated. Are there ways that you all could be or thinking about maybe addressing um, the brutality that people are facing uh, during this crisis? Well, I'll just say, for instance, there is currently in um, work release division um, the ombudsman, along with the assistant secretary of DOC, are have been co-chairing a work group to address the culture of retaliation, the culture of punishment, and uh, that is prevalent um, and has been cited multiple times through ombudsman work. Um, and so 
it's pushing and making sure that that culture changes, that um, they're, you know, and there's the very specific um, require or findings that our um, Department of Com Corrections <laughs> has agreed to um, respond to and change. So I think part of our job is to watchdog both as community and as legislature and to make sure that they make good on that commitment to address that. And, 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 there's, and, and so I think there, that is something that I'm very committed to uh, is making sure that that start, starts with work release uh, and you know working with um, organizations um, both inside and outside um, within our prison system to figure out how do we instill that change that change culture that needs to happen at all places. Uh, I'm very interested as, as a new member of the, the committee that oversees um, corrections and rehabilitation and human services, very interested in, in uh, making sure that I am prioritizing listening to um, those that are inside and outside um, in terms of how we, where we need legislation and where we need focused revenue and, and to be able to, for instance, improve the quality of food um, and, and quality of, because that's health, food is health. Um, and, and so how do we make sure that we are addressing that? Because it does put, you know, having poor food, having poor access to um, movement impacts people's um, vulnerability to the COVID-19, but really to all kinds of um, health issues. And so how, if we're really about rehabilitation, if we're really about addressing folks that are once they're, you know, that are in, and then the, the other push, the other big part is actually keeping people out um, from the beginning. But for those that are in, how do we make sure that they have clear pathways out um, to be able to, to um, um, do that in a dignified way? So um, I'm sorry, that is a long answer. I'll end now. <laughs> if, if you don't mind, Makita, uh, I'll, I asked staff about the vaccine question. I could just pop in real quick. Yeah, so yes. um, vaccines for inmates and staff at the Department of Corrections is phase two. So after healthcare workers and long-term care uh, facilities, the prison population will have access to, to vaccines in phase two. So we're, we're in phase one right now. Thank you so much for updating that information. My next two questions are going to be for J.M. Wong and for Nick Allen. Uh, the first question for J.M. is going to be, sorry, I'm, I have to find it in this ever-changing document that um, has been created. Jam, I think I direct messaged it to you. So um, the question is, I heard from JM Wong, a call for a large scale prisoner release and for DOC to investigate conditions in, prison, in prisons. Are there specific improvements right now that to DOC conditions that community advocates are calling for? And what has the dialogue with DOC officials been like, if any, in recent weeks on these issues? And that question um, is from Joseph O'Sullivan. Yeah, I think one of the major concerns that we have heard from people inside is the use of medical isolation, is the use of solitary confinement as a form of medical isolation and DOC being um, confusing about when it uses medical isolation and when they, under the cover of medical isolation, they're doing punitive forms of isolation. And that's actually what's happening right now um, at Stafford Creek, even though there was a guarantee in a memo to people who participated in this collective action to protect um, the black man who was assaulted. Right now, we have some individuals who, under the cover of medical isolation, are taken to um, EDSEG, um, punitive isolation. So we really want clarity around the way um, that DOC is administering medical support and ac access and not imposing um, the existing culture of retaliation on that. And then these basic needs of food, water, bathroom access, people should not have to feel afraid of getting maced or beaten up just for using the bathroom. And if DOC does not, the infrastructure of DOC seems to be really inflexible and you know unable to adapt to the changing COVID conditions. If that's the case, they need to be humble enough to acknowledge that and to start doing mass releases and Im immediately because this is crisis conditions for people inside. And there's constant fears that people are catching COVID even when, um, they are, they're supposed to be protected by DOC right now. We have tried to, um, we have contacted DOC, we have um, sent our, uh, our communi community letter to DOC, but have not received a response. So if DOC is able and willing to meet, 
in some kind of public setting, especially so all of us can see what kind of responses they have to the demands we've been pushing for since March, then that would be amazing. Thank you, JM. Uh, and Nick Allen, this next set of questions is for you. The first is, will there be another large petition or case brought by Columbia Legal Services like the previous one? And the second is, has there been any success with any PRP filed during this time? Oh, thanks, uh, Nikita. So as to the first question, um, you know, we haven't figured that out yet. Um, so we don't have any specific details around um, what that would look like right now, but we're very aware of what's going on. We continue to hear from, you know, people inside the prisons, um, uh, family members on the outside. And so we're monitoring, um, you know, the, the awful situation that's happening around the state and we'll consider all available you know, legal options to ensure that, that uh, DLC is held accountable and takes all steps to protect people in, um, in its custody for, from, uh, from COVID. Um, as to the second question, uh, I'm not entirely sure of this, but the um, PRPs that have been brought uh, in Washington state have generally not been um, successful. I think the last one that came out was um, a few weeks ago out of Division Two. It was a um, um, a case um, of an individual who I believe is like 78 years old, um, incapacitated, and um, Division Two uh, denied release for that individual. And that's generally where these um, where these PRPs have gone. There, there may be, um, there actually may be someone on the on the call who uh, uh, who represented um, Mr. Williams who could speak more to that. Thank you so much, Nick. If that is so, please direct message me, and we'll have you come on screen. Um, JM, do you mind providing just a brief uh, synopsis on how families who are on the call, if they want to get more involved, can do that? And then, if uh, one of the chat moderators could post information in the chat, that would be great. So as part of the Freedom Mall Collective, we're doing monthly family support group meetings and we just had one this past weekend. Our next one will be sometime in January. So we'll post that um, over the listserv. We have a listserv people can sign up on. Um, I'll put the email on the chat and the IG and Facebook and that's the way to get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you, Jam. And then I'll just close with this question. Um, and we may not have anyone available to answer it because I know Senator Nguyen had to go, but I think it's important to put the question out there. Um, the question was, can you help us understand why the governor continues to refuse to use graduated release, compassionate release, and other tools to release the population and get medically fragile prisoners out of harm's way? And then a connected question is, are we looking at earlier rapid release anytime soon because of all of this? Um, and I'm not, Nick, do you, I know that the Columbia Legal Services uh, previous lawsuit actually related to some of these. Um, do you mind sharing in terms of like what the response of the court was on on these areas and whether or not there's going to be an attempt to pursue this again? Yeah, well, I think that what we had put forth to the court um, was that release um, was one of the only ways that the department was going to be able to protect from, you know, uh, widespread um, outbreaks within DOC. And that information was based on our discussions with uh, public health experts uh, around the country um, and with uh, correctional experts that said that uh, density within prisons um, and the design of prisons um, allow for very quick spread unless um, reduction occurs. Um, now, there was a push uh, in the lawsuit for that to occur. And um, prior to oral argument, uh, the uh, governor issued a proclamation and executive order in which about 950 people were um, targeted for release back into the community. Um, we did not believe that that was anywhere near uh, the number of individuals that needed to be released. And we don't believe it was done in a strategic way. Um, to achieve the goals uh, uh, in order to mitigate against COVID. Um, the court um, ruled against us. So as a result, um, the petitioners and others in uh, DOC custody were, um, were not granted uh, release as a result. 
Thank you so much, Nick. And just to acknowledge and value everyone's time, um, this will be the end of the press conference. Uh, and just wanna thank everyone for taking the time to be here with us today um, and to share your knowledge. We want to deeply thank the families who have joined the call and thank the family members and our loved ones who are incarcerated or have been incarcerated for sharing your experiences. We acknowledge um, how traumatic that is and want you to know that our family support team is here for you. Um, so please access the information that JM shared and um, you can continue to direct message me questions until we uh, shut the Zoom down. And I'm happy to find a way to ensure that an appropriate person contacts um, press in order to answer those questions. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, and we will be sending out a follow-up release and posting this video shortly.